This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. Chapter Seven. Tom's first royal dinner. Somewhat after one in the afternoon, Tom resignedly underwent the ordeal of being dressed for dinner. He found himself as finely clothed as before, but everything was different. Everything changed from his ruff to his stockings. He was presently conducted with much state to a spacious and ornate apartment where a table was already set for one. Its furniture was all of massy gold and beautified with designs which well nigh made it priceless, since they were the work of Benvenuto. The room was half filled with noble servitors. A chaplain said grace, and Tom was about to fall too, for hunger had long been constitutional with him, but was interrupted by my lord the Earl of Berkeley, who fastened a napkin about his neck, for the great post of diaperers to the princes of Wales was hereditary in this nobleman's family. Tom's cup-bearer was present, and forestalled all his attempts to help himself to wine. The taster to his highness the Prince of Wales was there also prepared to taste any suspicious dish upon requirement, and run the risk of being poisoned. He was only an ornamental appendage at this time, and was seldom called upon to exercise his function. But there had been times, not many generations past, when the office of taster had its perils, and was not a grandeur to be desired. Why they did not use a dog or a plumber seems strange, but all the ways of royalty are strange. My lord Darcy, first groom of the chamber, was there, to do goodness knows what, but there he was, let that suffice. The lord chief butler was there, and stood behind Tom's chair, overseeing the solemnities, under command of the lord great steward, and the lord head cook, who stood near. Tom had three hundred and eighty-four servants beside these, but they were not all in that room, of course, nor the quarter of them, neither was Tom aware yet that they existed. All those that were present had been well drilled, within the hour, to remember that the prince was temporarily out of his head, and to be careful to show no surprise at his vagaries. These vagaries were soon on exhibition before them, but they only moved their compassion and their sorrow, not their mirth. It was a heavy affliction to them to see the beloved prince so stricken. Poor Tom ate with his fingers, mainly, but no one smiled at it, or even seemed to observe it. He inspected his napkin curiously, and with deep interest, for it was of a very dainty and beautiful fabric, then said, with simplicity, "'Prithee, take it away, lest in mine unheedfulness it be soiled.' The hereditary diaper took it away, with reverent manner, and without word to protest of any sort. Tom examined the turnips and the lettuce with interest, and asked what they were, and if they were to be eaten for it was only recently that men had begun to raise these things in England, in place of importing them as luxuries from Holland. Footnote. It was not till the end of this reign, Henry the Eighth, that any salads, carrots, turnips, or other edible roots were produced in England. The little of these vegetables that was used was formerly imported from Holland and Flanders. Queen Catherine, when she wanted a salad, was obliged to dispatch a messenger thither on purpose. Hume's History of England, Volume 3, page 314. End of footnote. His question was answered with grave respect, and no surprise manifested. When he had finished his dessert, he filled his pockets with nuts, but nobody appeared to be aware of it, or disturbed by it. But the next moment he was himself disturbed by it, and showed discomposure, for this was the only service he had been permitted to do with his own hands during the meal, and he did not doubt that he had done a most improper and unprincely thing. At that moment the muscles of his nose began to twitch, and the end of that organ to lift and wrinkle. This continued, and Tom began to evince a growing distress. He looked appealingly, first at one and then another of the lords about him, and tears came into his eyes. They sprang forward with dismay in their faces, and begged to know his trouble. Tom said with genuine anguish, "'I crave your indulgence. My nose itcheth cruelly. What is the custom and usage in this emergence? Pretty speed, for tis but a little time that I can bear it.' None smiled, but all were sore perplexed, and looked one to the other in deep tribulation for consul. But, behold, 
Here was a dead wall, and nothing in English history to tell how to get over it. The master of ceremonies was not present. There was no one who felt safe to venture upon this uncharted sea, or risk the attempt to solve this solemn problem. Alas, there was no hereditary scratcher. Meantime the tears had overflowed their banks, and begun to trickle down Tom's cheeks. His twitching nose was pleading more urgently than ever for relief. At last nature broke down the barriers of etiquette. Tom lifted up an inward prayer for pardon if he was doing wrong, and brought relief to the burdened hearts of his court by scratching his nose himself. His meal being ended, a lord came and held before him a broad, shallow golden dish with fragrant rose-water in it, to cleanse his mouth and fingers with, and my lord the hereditary diaper stood by with a napkin for his use. Tom gazed at the dish a puzzled moment or two, then raised it to his lips and gravely took a draught. Then he returned it to the waiting lord, and said, "'Nay, it likes me not, my lord. It hath a pretty flavour, but it wanteth strength.' This new eccentricity of the prince's ruined mind made all the hearts about him ache, but the sad sight moved none to merriment. Tom's next unconscious blunder was to get up and leave the table just when the chaplain had taken his stand behind his chair, and with uplifted hands and closed uplifted eyes was in the act of beginning the blessing. Still nobody seemed to perceive that the prince had done a thing unusual. By his own request, our small friend was now conducted to his private cabinet, and left there alone to his own devices. Hanging upon hooks in the oaken wainscoting were the several pieces of a suit of shining steel armour, covered all over with beautiful designs, exquisitely inlaid in gold. This martial panoply belonged to the true prince, a recent present from Madame Parr the Queen. Tom put on the greaves, the gauntlets, the plumed helmet, and such other pieces as he could don without assistance, and for a while was minded to call for help and complete the matter, but bethought him of the nuts he had brought away from dinner, and the joy it would be to eat them with no crowd to eye him, and no grand hereditaries to pester him with undesired services. So he restored the pretty things to their several places, and soon was cracking nuts and feeling almost naturally happy for the first time since God, for his sins, had made him a prince. When the nuts were all gone, he stumbled upon some inviting books in a closet, among them one about the etiquette of the English court. This was a prize. He lay down upon a sumptuous divan, and proceeded to instruct himself with honest zeal. Let us leave him there for the present. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Question of the Seal about five o'clock Henry the Eighth awoke out of an unrefreshing nap, and muttered to himself, "'Troublous dreams! Troublous dreams! Mine end is now at hand! So say these warnings, and my failing pulses do confirm it!' Presently a wicked light flamed up in his eye, and he muttered, "'Yet will not I die till he go before!' His attendants, perceiving that he was awake, one of them asked his pleasure concerning the Lord Chancellor, who was waiting without. "'Admit him! Admit him!' exclaimed the King eagerly. The Lord Chancellor entered, and knelt by the King's couch, saying, "'I have given order, and according to the King's command, the peers of the realm in their robes do now stand at the bar of the house, where, having confirmed the Duke of Norfolk's doom, they humbly wait His Majesty's further pleasure in the matter.' The King's face lit up with a fierce joy. Said he, "'Lift me up!' In mine own person will I go before my Parliament, and with mine own hand will I seal the warrant that rids me of— His voice failed, an ashen pallor swept the flush from his cheeks, and the attendants eased him back upon his pillows and hurriedly assisted him with restoratives. Presently he said sorrowfully, Alack, how have I longed for this sweet hour! And, lo! Too late it cometh, and I am robbed of this so coveted chance. But speed ye, speed ye, let others do this happy office, if tis denied to me. I put my great seal in commission. Choose thou the lords that shall compose it, and get ye to your work. Speed ye, man, before the sun shall rise and set again, bring me his head that I may see it. According to the king's command, so shall it be. Will it please your majesty to order that the seal be now restored to me, so that I may forth upon the business? 
the seal who keepeth the seal but thou please your majesty you did take it from me two days since saying it should no more do its office till your own royal hand should use it upon the duke of norfolk's warrant why so in sooth i did i do remember it what did i with it i am very feeble so oft these days doth my memory play the traitor with me tis strange strange the king dropped into inarticulate mumblings shaking his gray head weakly from time to time and gropingly trying to recollect what he had done with the seal at last my lord hertford ventured to kneel and offer information sire if that i may be so bold here be several that do remember with me how that you gave the great seal into the hands of his highness the prince of wales to keep against the day that true true most true interrupted the king fetch it go time flieth lord hertford flew to tom but returned to the king before very long troubled and empty-handed he delivered himself to this effect it grieveth me my lord king to bear so heavy and unwelcome tidings but it is the will of god that the prince's affliction abideth still and he cannot recall to mind that he received the seal so came i quickly to report thinking it were waste of precious time and little worth withal that any should attempt to search the long array of chambers and saloons that belong unto his royal high a groan from the king interrupted my lord at this point after a little while his majesty said with a deep sadness in his tone trouble him no more poor child the hand of god lieth heavy upon him and my heart goeth out in loving compassion for him and sorrow that i may not bear his burden on mine own old trouble-weighted shoulders and so bring him peace he closed his eyes fell to mumbling and presently was silent after a time he opened his eyes again and gazed vacantly around until his glance rested upon the kneeling lord chancellor instantly his face flushed with wrath what thou here yet by the glory of god and thou gettest not about that traitor's business thy mitre shall have holiday the morrow for lack of a head to grace withal the trembling chancellor answered good your majesty i cry o mercy i but waited for the seal man hast lost thy wits the small seal which aforetime i was wont to take with me abroad lieth in my treasury and since the great seal hath flown away shall not it suffice hast lost thy wits be gone and harkee come no more till thou do bring his head the poor chancellor was not long in removing himself from this dangerous vicinity nor did the commission waste time in giving the royal assent to the work of the slavish parliament and appointing the morrow for the beheading of the premier peer of england the luckless duke of norfolk footnote attainder of norfolk the house of peers without examining the prisoner without trial or evidence passed a bill of attainder against him and sent it down to the commons the obsequious commons obeyed his the king's directions and the king having affixed the royal assent to the bill by commissioners issued orders for the execution of norfolk on the morning of the twenty ninth of january the next day hume's history of england volume three page three o seven end of footnote end of chapter eight